So I was leaving the Rolex boutique and lo and behold, I saw a Vacheron Constantin boutique. I thought, why not? I've always wanted to try on one of the Holy Trinity brands. I mean, what's the worst that could happen, right? Let's get into it. Okay, before we get into the video, real quick, there are some housekeeping stuff. First, I'm an ambassador for Watch Crunch. It's the home of watch nerds like you and me. Join me at the link below and you'll thank me later. In fact, the link would take you to a discussion that is very relevant to this video. I'll explain it at the end. Next, let me do a quick wrist check. I'm happy to be wearing my Omega CK859. As you probably know, this watch has already been discontinued after only a six month production run. I promise I'll do a review. In fact, I've got a whole queue of watches set up for review, so look out for that. Also, some of you have been asking me to finish the second video on my Rolex visit. Absolutely. I'm working on that right now. In fact, it'll be the next video after this one, which is a nice segue into today's topic. So I was leaving the Rolex boutique and there was the Grail, one of the holy trinity brands, Vacheron Constantin. Now, I've always wanted to try on their watches, but truth be told, I was afraid to walk in there. Their watches start at 30000 That's almost the cost of my car. So why are they considered one of the Holy Trinity brands? Well, look over their incredible history. Vacheron Constantin has a rich history dating back to 1755. In 1790, Vacheron Constantin created the world's first watch complication. In 1824, VC created a jumping hour watch. This type of watch uses a disc with numerals that jump instantaneously to display the hour, making it easier to read the time quickly. In 1885, VC created the first non-magnetic timepiece, which included a complete lever assortment made of materials able to withstand magnetic fields. In 1901, Vacheron Constantin earned its first hallmark of Geneva label for a top quality movement. In the mid-1950s, VC produced ultra-thin movements for wristwatches and became known as a luxury watch brand. In 2015, Vacheron Constantin set a new record with the reference 57260, the most complicated watch ever made. This watch had 57 complications, including a double-sided design with different time displays on each side. Wow. So that's an incredible and intimidating history. But still, I thought, what would it be like to try one on? What would it feel like on the wrist? Would I be blown away? What would be the difference between that and my Seiko's or Citizen or my Montenoble? I had to find out. I had to know. We're watch collectors after all. So I walk up to the front and the door's closed? What? It's the middle of the day. Then a doorman on the other side opens it up for me. They are really going for that nightclub atmosphere. Make it feel really exclusive. Wow, okay. I end up talking to a very nice sales associate and almost immediately she asks me if it's a special occasion and what I do for a living. Wow, you hit me up with that already? Right away? What are you, Rolex? I think she was hoping I was a secret millionaire. Well, the joke's on her. I work for the government. I let her know that, no, it's not a special occasion, but I'm a watch collector. I love watches and would love to try out this special brand. But there was something that I needed to confess before we get started. I believe in honesty, so I need to let her know that these watches were really outside my budget. I told her that I couldn't afford watches 50K and above, and I braced for her reaction. I had this image of the beefy doorman grabbing my collar and throwing me out the door. But no, she was very kind and offered to show me something in my range. But then I told her I got something even more to confess. This might be even more of a problem than the price. Yes, this might mean that I don't even try a single watch in the shop and leave empty handed. She asked me, what is it? And I had to tell her, I love 37 millimeter size watches. 
That is what I want to wear. Do you have any watches in that size? Remember my six and a half inch wrist from the other video? And she said, no. No, we do not have any of those watch sizes. However, we do have a 38 millimeter case size watch. And it might be within your range. The retail was only 25,000. Wow, there was only one watch that fit my criteria, close to 37 millimeter and below 30,000. Talk about limited edition. So I tried it on. Well, let's take a look at the watch. It was the traditional manual winding. Uh, it's a 18K rose gold watch that combines precision and sophistication in its design. The railroad style minute counter, an iconic feature of the traditional collection, adorns the edge of the dial in small seconds. The manual one movement offers a power reserve of nearly three days and features exceptional finishing visible through the open work case back. Well, at least that's according to their marketing. So how did the watch feel? Well, it felt, honestly, rather flimsy, like a toy watch. Now wait, I don't mean that it felt light. I understand that it's a high-end dress watch and should be light, but it felt both light and, uh, sorry, cheap. For an asking price of 22,000, I was really shocked. So I stood there for a minute, not wanting to say anything and just, you know, processing what I was feeling. I tried to smile and nod my head so I wouldn't offend a sales associate. Now, if you're a fan of the brand, I get it. The history is amazing. And if there is something that I'm missing from the experience, please let me know. Tell me where I went wrong. Did I not understand the history? Did I miss something in the quality of the watch? Or what? Please tell me why this watch is worth 22 grand. I would really like to know. I couldn't help but think about the better experience that I had with lesser known brands. My Ferris Stott and Hope taught me to love manual wind movements. My Montenovo showed me that a bracelet could be extremely comfortable. My Seiko Tuna Diver has tons of history and prestige, but honestly, I was not feeling that from this watch. I couldn't help but think about the better experiences that I had with more affordable brands. It's like choosing between a fancy restaurant with tiny portions or a cozy diner with mouth-watering burgers. Sometimes the expensive option isn't always the most satisfying. Now I'm searching for something to love about this watch and I ask her about the width of the watch. She doesn't know. Wait, isn't that the primary selling point of these high-end dress watches? You know, besides the movement. VC is known for their thin watch movements and their case sizes. Okay, so it's fair that she doesn't know all the specs on all the watches. Later looked it up and it was eight millimeters. Now, that's rather impressive, it is. But I've seen automatics with similar case widths for less money. And my Federer Constant Slimline has a case width of six millimeters. It's actually a little bit less. Yes, it's a quartz movement, but I don't mind. I don't mind quartz when it's appropriate, and it works great in a slim dress watch. But now it got worse, because the crown action was pretty lousy. It was so small that my normal fingers couldn't get a grip. I was struggling to really turn that crown. So the sales associate sees this and she says, I tell my clients to use the roll of the index finger like this. And she means run the crown over the index finger to turn it. What? That's not a solution to me. Tudor has a better crown action. Rolex does much better. What a disappointment. I must admit though, the hand finished movement was a sight to behold. It's a true work of art. The open work case back, which, uh, which uh, showcases the exceptional finishes no wonder they have a Geneva of Hallmark label. I told her I admired the perlage finish, but she corrected me and she said it was Cote de Genève. So the finishing was artful, but then I could always visit an art gallery for free. Plus, I wouldn't have to worry about scratching a masterpiece. 
So what did I learn from all this? That the diminishing returns on luxury watches is very real. It's real. No way would I pay $23,000 for this watch. How much is heritage and history worth? Maybe to you it's worth it. For me, not so much. Now I mentioned that I'm an ambassador for WatchCrunch. There is a thread going on there on this very topic. I'll drop the link below, check it out, and join in the discussion. So that's my visit to the Vacheron Constant Boutique. What did we learn? Luxury watches can be, stunning, uh, can be stunning, but sometimes it's the budget-friendly options that steal our hearts. And hey, at least I did get a story out of it. Share your thoughts in the comments below. See you in the next video.